most of the cases. But if you leave this very nice uh, category, this category that you would first consider, then immediately you, uh, you, you see that things become quite interesting. So already for the category O, you, well, you stay, it still stay semi-simple, but otherwise it becomes um, yeah, uh, more special. So this category is not closed in a tender product and also modular properties of characters are somehow um, not perfect. Um, and, and then if one goes to these bigger categories, uh, essentially all, all what one knows is a classification of simple modules, uh, essentially due to uh, Kazuya Kawasetsu and David Redoubt using a result by Putoni and Silke. And then, um, and uh, now, so this is the state of the art of uh, representation theory of F and Wales X algebras at admissible level. And before that, I, kind of presented a roadmap what you want to do, or maybe what is, a, what is a good guide if you want to do representation theory of a vertex algebra. I said you first maybe classify simple, try to understand it as an abelian category, classify simple modules, but then uh, category won't be semi-simple, so you have to try to understand extensions. And, um, and the only thing I told you about extensions so far is that as long as you stay in the category of lower bounded modules, extensions are to completely determined by extensions on the top level, by extensions on the level of the horizontal subalgebra, the finite dimensional Lie algebra. That is very good news because that means it's a it's a, it's a classical problem somehow. Okay. And now uh, now we want to be better. We now we want we want to do everything. Um, but um, we are not good enough to do everything at the moment. So we we restrict to the what we can do in the rank one SL2. And that's, that's surely a good idea because, uh, uh, because what, whatever you want to do, it should be extremely instructive to do it in SL2. It should be clear because it's, um, things are more computable, but the general story should hopefully be relatively similar. Modulo, of course, <laughs> potential big yeah, technicalities. So, I will now spend quite a, a bit of time uh, talking about finite dimensional Lie algebra SL2, no hat, no affine, um, to, to get a feeling on uh, uh, what, what we are talking about. So let me just uh, introduce a little bit of So I hope you will en enjoy this, right? Because this should be relaxing. Yeah, SL2, we all know by heart, and you can, even if you take a few minutes after this lecture, you can check what I present. By your own computations. So uh, I take uh, call the basis by the, give it the standard names, and I, I might normalize a little bit unusual. So let me just uh, uh, write down uh, what my uh, what the relations are. So um, and I always only write down what is non-zero. Then then we also always have to fix a bilinear form. And will be denoted by kappa. You require that the Cartan subalgebra generator has norm two, and the product of E and F is one. Okay. Now, one more in, uh, ingredient is extremely uh, important for for the coming discussion, namely the Casimir. The, the quadratic Casimir, uh, which uh, generates the center of the universal enveloping algebra of SL2. And now uh, I, I will write it down in, um, in three different ways. If you're asked to how, to how to write it down, you usually what you do is you fix a basis, uh, you fix a bilinear form, then you have the corresponding dual basis, and the Casimir is just the the sum over all basis element paired with their dual elements. That's the Casimir, which you can immediately rid, rid of from this. And uh, But now we can also uh, use the commutation relations to, to rewrite it. I, I don't want an E, F, and F, E uh, in, the, in the formula, but only one of the two. So for example, I can replace E, F by F times E plus H, because this is what the commutator tells me. And similarly, I can also replace 
f times e by e times f minus h using the commutation relations. And you will see in a moment why I'm doing this. Okay, so these are the conventions or standard convention. Really what we will need is uh, this formula for the Casimir in a moment again. And now, now we do representation theory and I do it in the same logic as I uh, also present f and one I, uh, I first present, or maybe in the reverse one, I first present the simplest type of representations than we know, and then I go step by step more complicated. So um, uh, everybody has to know the finite dimensional irreducible representations of SL2, right? This is something one simply has to know. And uh, so I uh, I use the notation LN um, for the n-dimensional irreducible one. So in particular, I don't label this, this representation uh, by its weight label, but by its dimension. Uh, I, I do this because uh, the, uh, these things first were introduced by physicists and they came with this notation and it got stuck. And um, so, so, so in, in particular with this notation, what I present uh, uh, compares well to the literature. Okay. Um, so n-dimensional representation and uh, the, the basis I denote by v0 up to vn minus one. And uh, so what do we have here? The, these, these basis vectors are of course weight vectors. And so h acts by multiplication by, um, by this number. E maps VI to VI minus one times some number. So this is if I is not uh, equal to zero and we, we make a v, V0 the highest weight vector. So it's annihilated by, by E and F maps uh, VI to I plus one times VI plus one. And, and then the, the last vector of Vn minus one is the lowest weight vector. So you, um, you can quickly check that this gives you, uh, yeah, gives, gives you the n-dimensional irreducible representation of SL2. Okay, this is the warm up. Next thing is uh, if we, we go to our diagram, right? So if, if, if we were to, uh, and go to the affine Lie algebra, then we could induce uh, uh, representations of SL2 to representation of SL2 head, and inducing these would give us objects in kashtan lustig So now I, I go to highest weight modules, and uh, inducing those would give us objects in the category O. And uh, so these highest weight modules are called D plus, the plus indicating highest weight, Lam that is a highest weight module, lambda, what the highest weight is. So lambda is a complex number here. And the underlying vector space is, a, is now an infinite sum of weight spaces. So I call a basis vector of these weight spaces, I label them by, by, their, by, by their weight. That means by their h eigenvalue. And then um, and so now what do I do with E? Well, first of all, I want this V lambda to be a high spec vector. So I ask it to be um, annihilated by. Uh, v lambda, but now what about the action of E uh, on on an arbitrary weight vector? Well, it, it definitely should be a weight vector whose weight is changed by two. But uh, but what's the multiplicity? How do how do I compute this? Well, let's let's think about it. Um, I uh, this this, uh, this weight vector with index uh, weight uh, lambda minus two i is the image of the of f acting on the weight vector. Uh, weight shifted by two, all right? But now I have here an E times F, and what can I do now? 
I can use that E times F is uh, equal to uh, the Casimir plus a polynomial in H, right? So I can use here this formula for the Casimir. So I, I can use that E times F is the same thing as one half times the Casimir plus a certain polynomial in H. Mm -hmm. But I know how H acts on this vector. And so that means uh, uh, this one is determined by the action of the Casimir on this module. So let me denote the Casimir eigenvalue by delta lambda. And then Um, and uh, and so this action uh, must be given by this formula, right? So so uh, this is one of the reasons why I introduced here the Casimir and this different base, right? Because on a highest weight vector, I have to specify my weight spaces. I have to specify the highest weight vector, and I have uh, I can uh, uh, define my action of f to be just like mapping one weight vector to the next one, and then the action of e is fixed uniquely by the Casimir action. And now, what is but what is the Casimir action on a on a highest weight module? So let's first write it down what it is. So it's the eigenvalue of the Casimir on this module. And how do I compute this? See, if you were alive, I would now ask you and wait until one of you uh, uh, tells me that I, online it is always a little bit inconvenient. What do I do? I, I look at the highest weight vector because that's a constrained vector and see how it acts on this one, right? So, I mean, it's uh, this is a sim uh, this is an irreducible module, at least if I take generic weight data, it's an indecomposable module. So the Casimir needs to act by a scalar. So that means if I can compute it on a, on, a, on one wisely chosen vector, I can get the eigenvalue on the on the module. And so I, I look at it uh, how it acts on the highest weight vector. Why? Because I, I I simply write down the formula for the Casimir again, and I, I choose the form where e is to the right of f. Because why do I do this? Because it's a highest weight vector. E annihilates the highest weight vector. So this formula becomes just, um, uh, uh, is, is just determined by the highest weight. So, and then, so this gives me, tells me what delta lambda is. Okay, you, you'll see in a moment why I did this, uh, presented like this, because uh, you have to understand, uh, I mean, Surely you are very, very familiar with finite dimensional modules, right? Integrable modules for finite dimension D algebra. That's what you learn in the second year of university or maybe even first year. Um, but but the rest is much less textbook material. So next thing is, of course, we why should we restrict to highest weight models? You could equally well look at low, lowest weight models, but this is essentially the same thing, right? Because the uh, lowest weight modules is a highest weight module where I take my negative, my, make my negative root positive and vice versa. So it's as similar as uh, the highest weight module just with interchanging the roles of E and F. I, I don't. And now the interesting thing, and now uh, comes with the relaxed highest weight module. This is surely something you are much less familiar with. So, and uh, let, let's see what we can do. So first of all, we give it a name and the, the index minus will become clear later, but uh, I, I, I will uh, in the, uh, label it by two labels, lambda, a weight label and delta, but what will, will it be? It will be a Casimir eigenvalue. So a weight label. Here, this is a Casimir eigenvalue.
and uh, in, if you were to go to higher rank you you would in fact label this by a central character because you would have to specify the complete action of the center of the universal enveloping algebra okay so what's the underlying vector space this is now again an infinite sum of weight spaces but now it is uh, we, we label it uh, the label goes over all integers so and this indicates that we will never uh, I mean, um, this will be a module that will be generated by any choice of rate vectors here. Um, with the uh, and um, and it it will neither have highest nor lowest weight vector. You'll see in a moment that this what I just said is not uh, exactly correct. It's correct for generic choices of lambda and delta. And for and, and the non-generic case, we will. Uh, discuss right afterwards. So the label is the weight label. Now we require, uh, and now we, we we make a choice and we say, uh, um, I, I make the, the choice that I say E maps um, a weight vector to the next weight vector. I could e equally well have chosen uh, that F does this. And uh, this choice res uh, refers to the superscript minus or plus. If it's a minus, I, I make this choice with E. If it's a plus, I will make a similar choice, but for F. Okay, so now we, we require that the Casimir acts by multiplication of the scalar delta. And now, uh, so the, the point is this is now very similar to the highest weight models before. Uh, we, once we have specified the action of E and we know the Casimir, then uh, the action of F is uniquely specified. The only difference to the uh, highest weight case is that the Casimir action is also specified by having a highest weight vector. Here we don't have a highest weight vector and so we can simply choose or favorite value for the Casimir. So what do I do? F acting on this vector, well, this vector is the image of E acting on, um, on, 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 on the previous weight vector. And now I do the same thing as before. I, pre, uh, pre, uh, I replace, I notice that F times E is the Casimir plus a polynomial in H. And now I insert numbers. So I, I will not do this now because the formula becomes leng lengthy, but so it tells me that F acting on V lambda plus two I maps it to V lambda plus two I minus two. And the coefficient is this one half delta minus, uh, minus one half the I, this lambda plus two I minus two squared minus lambda plus two I minus two, this number. Okay. You ask questions if you have any. So this, okay. uh, so the picture of this uh, e lambda minus will look like the tilting you you just uh, draw before. Uh, you draw before? Uh, yeah, exactly. And and uh, maybe um, maybe I should now um, draw a few uh, pictures. So the finite dimensional module, we think about it as we have finite dimensional weight vectors, right? And uh, now we have that. Um, E maps in one direction, F in the other one, uh, right? Uh, I mean, you, you choose your direction, uh, but it's finite dimensional. It has a highest weight vector. So this means this, this vector is mapped to zero under E and this one is mapped to zero under F, right? For a highest weight module, we would have infin infinite, infinitely many weight vectors, but it still has here a highest weight vector Uh, and uh, but no lowest weight vector, right? And and you see uh, in these pictures, I replaced all the dots for for the for the weight vectors for the weight spaces just by a straight line because I, it's quicker to draw a line than many dots, right? Okay, and and then the if we go to the relaxed highest weight module, it would have infinitely many weight spaces, and it goes to infinity in both directions. 
So, so this, this line, these pictures illustrate, want to illustrate the action. Okay, very good. Now, um, okay, so, so now we, we can ask ourselves uh, this E minus, uh, well, surely it can't have a highest weight vector because E will never, uh, that doesn't act on any weight vector as zero. But can it have a lowest weight vector? Well, F uh, maps a weight vector to some number times um, uh, times the next uh, weight vector. So if this number vanishes, then, then the vector becomes a lowest weight vector. So we, we, we see, so observe that we have that um, F, uh, so this V lambda plus two I is a lowest weight vector precisely, well, if this, uh, if it acts as zero, so that means uh, precisely if um, the Casimir eigenvalue is equal to one half, lambda plus two i minus two squared plus lambda plus two i minus two. This if the, uh, and of course, I, get, I can choose any complex number for Casimir eigenvalue. So in particular, I can choose this one, right? So what does this tell us? So this tells us that, uh, uh, with a little bit of thought, it tells us that uh, this model that I constructed is um, generically simple, except if I can, if I choose the Casimir eigenvalue to be of the form one half mu squared plus mu for mu in the same coset of the root lattice as lambda. And with my normalizations, the root lattice is identified with the even integers. That's just a, uh, and the, the, I, I use a little bit in unusual conventions so that I don't have to write square roots. But that's or, um, And in the case that it's not simple, what happens? In that case, we have a lowest weight vector. So we have a lowest weight submodule. And uh, in, in that case, so that means we, we have a lowest weight submodule. And uh, if you look at it, its weight is mu plus two. And what is the quotient? The quotient then, of course, must be a highest weight module and its weight, highest weight level is um, mu, of course, then, right? So, um, um, and, and, and in fact, we, uh, uh, yeah, so, so um, yeah, th these are the relaxed highest weight models. So what do we learn from those? We, we learn very, uh, very unlike the uh, highest and lowest weight models that we are used to, they are not uniquely specified by a choice of a, of a weight, a highest or lowest weight. Well, it can't be because there is no highest or lowest weight. They're specified by a weight, which is not unique because if I shift this weight by, by, by an element in the root lattice, it describes the same module. Um, and, uh, but but uh, therefore it is not labeled by a weight label together with the Casimir eigenvalue. More, more, more professionally speaking with a central character. And um, right, and, and now it turns out these modules, they are generically simple, but um, whenever you choose your, um, your, your, your weight, I mean, your Casimir eigenvalue um, being related to an element in the, in the corset of a chosen weight, uh, in, in this sense, then your, your relaxed highest weight module, this E minus lambda comma delta is not simple but um, it has a simple submodule and the corresponding quotient is simple as well, a lowest and a highest weight module. Okay, now what can we, uh, so are we done with finding all indecomposable um, finite, uh, modules of the finite dimensional Lie algebra with, um, well, surely not. We, have, we, we definitely put one restriction here, namely I, uh, I, I require that the Casimir acts semi-simple and in fact also the Cartan subalgebra. But if you remember yesterday, I told you on lower, lower bonded modules of the affine 
uh, vertex algebra at admissible level, one knows that the center acts semi-simple, so this condition is okay. And uh, making the choice that Karan sub-algebra is semi-simple, acts semi-simple is a standard choice. If not, you would immediately get infinite length modules and uh, the story would immediately get go out of hand. So this is, so my choices here are a natural. And with this uh, choices, I have given you almost all indecomposable modules of the finite dimensional Lie algebra. I have. So, so Thomas, may I ask you a question? Yeah. yeah so sure. here, here the, the relaxed module is the e lambda delta minus. Yeah. Uh, my question is that why do you denote it by minus? Yes, I'm explaining this now. Uh, so this is the, now the next thing. Um, because now, it is go up and the go down, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, I, I, <laughs> so I have two choices uh, in, in the construction. I, here I made the choice. So let me. Um, 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 here, here I made a choice. I, I distinguished uh, E over F. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 oh, okay, I see, I see. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I see. So, sure. so you can make another choice, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Can... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. We can still we can skip yeah, yeah, the next. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean uh, anyway, yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. I yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. exactly okay. the same thing as, as before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yes, only, yes. With, with the only difference that I now say that uh, a weight vector is by mapped by F to the next one. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the chosen Casimir eigenvalue specifies the action of E. And uh, that means E uh, maps a weight vector to the previous one times. Uh, a scalar depending on Casimir eigenvalue and weight label. And I run into exactly the same uh, feature uh, before. We will, in that case, we will never have a lowest weight vector, but we have a highest weight vector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is again of the same form with me yeah. in the same core set as the mm -hmm. next mm -hmm. weight. So, so in the end, uh, I, I will, why don't I write it uh, quickly? Because it's in fact, Quite uh, quick. Oh, yeah. So, I, uh, so I, um, the um, I, I do the uh, almost exactly the same. So I, I, I'm doing what I just said. So, and you'll see the formulas are very similar. Just that I interchange the role of E and F. Now I say F maps a weight vector to the next one, and uh, of course the. The, I, I specify the action of the Casimir, just acting by delta. And then, uh, and these all these choices uniquely specify the action of E now, right? Because I can write uh, the E acting on this vector as E times F acting on the previous weight vector. And, and then I can use that E times F is the Casimir plus a polynomial in H. And um, and I can insert numbers, and I have the same thing as before, right? If you, uh, I, I will send the slides later also to Jinwei. You can upload it on the page. If you compare what I wrote down for e plus and e minus, almost the same thing, except that rollout of f and e either changed. In particular, what we see that is that this e plus lambda now is simple, except if the same condition for the Casimir eigenvalue holds, well, a priori it doesn't look at the same, but how can I write one half mu squared minus mu? I can write it as one half mu minus two squared plus mu minus two. Um, uh, except if delta can be written like this for mu in the same coset as our uh, coset. Uh, of the root letters as lambda. And what happens in this case? In that case, we have a plus as a submodule, a highest weight vector, a highest weight module as a submodule. And that's maybe, I mean, that's the justification for the plus label. It labels the type of module that has you have as a submodule. 
and then the quotient module must be a lowest weight module. So you see, um, uh, so this means um, this construction of the relaxed highest weight modules, you make a choice and essentially you make a choice of what are your, for example, you could think about it as a choice of positive roots. I could either uh, say my, my usual positive root, the correspond, corresponding to E is the one, or I, or I take the negative one. And, if, and um, the, this choice doesn't make a difference generically in the following sense. So let me write it down. If delta is not of the special value, of the special type. So, so if uh, I can't write uh, delta as one half mu squared plus mu for any mu in the same coset as lambda, then what do we have? We have that the E plus lambda delta is isomorphic to E minus lambda delta, and that's quite easy to see. And so then it doesn't really makes sense to have this, it makes the superscript redundant, so we remove it. And, 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 and um, so, I, uh, so what did we learn? Um, I just presented SL2 and I'm, I imagine in, in fact that I presented for quite a few of you something new. So we were looking at uh, in decomposable modules of the finite dimensional Lie algebra SL2, on which the Cartan subalgebra, the H, is semi simple, on which the center, that means polynomials in the Casimir, acts semi simple, and no further restriction. And uh, what we found is we have um, the, the, the known types of modules, this means finite dimensional modules, we have highest weight modules, we have lowest weight modules. And we have this relaxed highest weight modules. This relaxed highest weight module, because there is no weight vector that specifies Casimir action, uh, actually has a second label, namely the Casimir eigenvalue. And it turns out if you choose this, uh, this generically, you will get a simple module. And if you choose it very wisely, then this module will split into a, a, a submodule and a, uh, and a quotient module, one of them being highest, and then the other one lowest weight. Um, right, and uh, um, right. Uh, right, and then of, of course, I it, it could then of course also be that the the uh, the highest or lowest weight module appearing in there is uh, itself not simple. Right, but, but I, I, I neglected that. Okay, um, now let's go on a little bit with a finite dimensional Lie algebra finite dimension SL2. Let's dis uh, discuss what we know about tensor products. So, uh, and let me write exercise uh, because it's kind of a nice exercise. Um, so what is the tensor product of finite dimensional with finite dimensional irreducibles? It's of course a sum of finite dimensional. And um, remember the label denotes the dimension and not the weight. That's why there's a funny shift by a one everywhere appearing. Anyway, um, here the label uh, goes up in steps by two and, and it's a sum of a bunch of finite dimensional ones. What happens if I take the tensor product of a finite dimensional with a highest weight model? Well, you first look at, uh, surely the tensor, the tensor product of the highest weight vectors is again a highest weight vector. And, its highest weight is uh, the sum of the highest weight labels. And then if you think about it, uh, okay, well, that must uh, generate a highest weight module. And uh, uh, then uh, whatever is left, you still you have again one vector of maximum weight uh, left. So it must generate another highest weight label. If, if you then think about what is still left, uh, there's again a single vector of maximum weight left. And so you iterate it. And uh, by, by that consideration, you immediately arrive that you have that the tensor product is um, of this type. Again, it goes in steps by two. Um, in fact, the same uh, consideration applies if you take the tensor product of two highest weight module, x with the only difference that this is a difference that this is not a finite sum. Okay, 
So these are the things that are, in fact, a quick exercise to compute. But now, now what happens if I ask you to compute the tensor product of a highest with a lowest weight module? Or even worse, if I ask you to compute the tensor product of any module uh, with a relaxed highest weight module. And you, 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 you just try it. You don't have anything that gives you information. Right? So this is, uh, you, you, you don't, uh, I mean, for example, you, you, I mean, the problem is you, there's no highest or lowest, lowest weight vector, and then you, um, weight spaces are, are not um, finite dimensional. So you, um, you, you simply can't determine the standard product. It's a difficult, difficult thing. Uh, and uh, in any case, already by highest weight or highest weight, we get an infinite sum, right? And so now, what do we usually require for a tensor category? I mean, for our category, uh, I mean, usually we, by a category, we mean finite sums of objects, right? We can, of course, complete it, and sometimes we like to do that. Um, but in particular, usually we want the tensor product of uh, two modules to be an object, and again, so finite sum and not something in a completion. So and we see already for the finite dimensional the algebra SL2, this, this finiteness concept of tensor product doesn't work, right? So in principle, this, I mean, this, this should tell you there's a little chance for this to be better for the affine one, right? Why, why, right? It, it's, it's just, everything is worse there. Um, and, uh, but really what it, it should tell you is the universal affine VOA will have huge issues with the tensor product if you go to bigger categories. Um, that, that, that's a must, that's a guarantee. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but the miracle that you hope will happen, and it in fact will indeed happen, is that if you um, go to admissible level, things become better. So um, I mean, what, what I will tell you over these days is that the tensor product of the simple affine vertex algebra of SL2 at admissible level behaves better than the tensor product of the corresponding modules of the finite dimensional Lie algebra. So let's talk about SL2 hat. So uh, now the basis is again given by E, H, and Fs, just that they now have a, a sublabel that I will always call mode. This will be an integer, right? I don't want to write e times t to the n, so I write e with the subindex n for, for that. And then you have the central element at the derivation. So, and, um, and I, I only make more explicit what I yes, yesterday wrote down for, in general, for affine vertex, uh, for affine D algebras. So now the, the commutator of h with e is 2e, so this means the commutator of hm with E n is two times E, and then the mode labels add up. Commutator of H m with H n, where H commutes with itself. So you only get a contribution coming with the central element. Um, and uh, multiplicity is the, the pairing of H with itself is two, so that's the two here. Then H with F, so minus two F with mode labels adding up, and E with F, where the commutator of E with F is an H, so you get an H with mode labels adding up, and because the trace of E and F is one, you also have the central element appearing if M is equal to minus N. Okay. What else did I tell you yesterday? Well, I told you um, a theorem from, from Futoni and Zilke saying that every simple module is the spectral flow twist of a simple lower bounded module. So what was the spectral flow? This was, were these automorphisms of the FIV algebra that, were, that are indu induced by uh, uh, translations, uh, FIV translations corresponding to covates. So it's the big, a translation group. And um, and uh, while yesterday my formula were, pro were probably abstract here for SL2, everything becomes 
concrete, the root lattice has been identified <coughs> to Z. Then the weight lattice is, I mean, weights and co-weights are the same for SL2 is simply laced. And the, uh, so the, the weight lattice is identified with the integers. That's of course very convenient. And so then I, and then the spectral flow, acts, it maps EN, it shifts the mode by minus L. The F, FN is then shifted in the opposite direction. Fn to Fn plus L. The action on the H is less interesting. Well, it just H0 is shifted by a multiple of the central element, and the central element is left invariant. Okay. Very good. Um, now, uh, now I uh, will go on and I simply give you a bunch of definitions and notations. Um, and I will repeat what they mean once they appear, just that uh, now we have them uh, once and for all written down what we need. So first, I'm working from now on, the central element will always act by a specific number and the specific number will be an admissible number for SL2. I defined this in gen for general G yesterday and for SL2, what does it mean? The level is admissible for, uh, for SL2. If shifted by the dual Coxeter number, it is a rational number. a positive rational number where the numerator is greater or equal to the dual Coxeter number of SL2. And of course, you and we are co-prime here. Now, by VKG, so by VKSL2, I mean the universal affine VOA. And, and um, note that this one in this case, so this is special for SL2, this VOA is simple if and only if the level K is not admissible. For higher rank, this statement is not true. Uh, So by LK, K with the lower index, I denote the simple quotient. And now let's go to the notation of, uh, um, uh, and, uh, of, uh, of modules. So first of all, one definition, I, I will repeat it later. Um, so if, if we have a lower bounded, I think I also said it yesterday. If I have a lower bounded module, well here, BOA module, um, there exists the, the notion of an almost simple quotient. You of course know what a simple quotient is. Uh, and almost simple means uh, that it almost always coincides with the simple quotient. Um, it means, um, the almost simple quotient of the module is the quotient by the sum of all submodules that do not intersect the top level. So this means if you do this uh, quotient on the top level, then it won't change, but, um, but you will quotient ideals that live below that and um, yeah, that are below the top level.
Okay, so why uh, do I introduce this? Because I, what, what do I want to do is I, I mean, I want um, to construct good modules for the affine vertex algebra. Now we know how to go from a module from the finite dimension Lie algebra to a module of the affine um, Lie algebra. We just in, induce it in the usual way, right? Like, like you in, induce while modules. And, um, uh, but, but then uh, the, we want, um, we, we want to quotient out by everything that uh, is not consistent with the action of the simple affine VOA. And uh, it, it turns out what you have to do is you have to take almost simple quotients. We, we have this E types, this relaxed size weight models. They are almost always simple, but sometimes they are not. What we do in those cases, we, we, we induce to a model of the affine Lie algebra. And then we take the almost simple quotient. So on the, that we still have a splitting on the top level. I mean, the submodule and the, 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 the short exact sequence coming from the top level. Okay. So we once and for all fix admissible uh, K. And this means I, I fix two co prime positive integers U and V as here in the notion of admissible. Um, and now um, we take M to be an SL2 module. So one of the modules I um, discussed the last 49 minutes, no, but in, um, I, I, I had just uh, discussed and what can I do with such a module? I can uh, get a module of the FID algebra, which I denote by M hat by just um, doing the usual construction. So what do I do is, Um, you can say, so uh, what do I do is I take this module, I lift it to a module of the positive part of SL2. So by this, I mean the subalgebra generated by the, by the positive modes where this mode index is non-negative together with, of course, the action of the central element and the derivation. The action of the derivation, I don't care at all because it's fixed by Vera Soro. Um, and the central element, uh, I, I, I lifted to an action also of the central element by requiring it that it acts by, by multiplication with K uh, with a level. Okay. And now, um, um, and now I define the modules of in, 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 uh, interest. And what, what I always will do is I will write a very curly thing for example, curly L with index R. And what I mean by this is then the simple quotient of the module of the finite dimensional Lie algebra with, with the same letter, just not just the normal letter, not, not curly, induced to, to the affine Lie algebra level, a central element like acting by K and then taking simple quotient. And I do the same thing with all the others. So with the highest and lowest eight weight modules, um, I will do the same thing, um, though with a few, a little bit of extra notation. Uh, which, so I I now denote it by a sublabel R comma S instead of lambda, and I I will explain in a moment what lambda R comma S is. Um, let me just first also and here for the e type modules i uh, i define first of all i i will uh, um, omit the label, the the superscript plus minus whenever it's irrelevant and then and in this case i define it as the almost simple quotient of the affinization of the relaxed highest weight module that I have uh, defined before. And now here, I still owe you um, the labels I didn't introduce. So here by delta R comma S, I mean the following number determined by, so this is a V, V, my V and R look very similar. Um, so it is a V times R, minus u times s. Remember, 
the shifted level is u over v. So this is where this v and u come from. Here we have a v squared and, uh, and the denominator for u times v. And this lambda r comma s is equal to r minus one minus the shifted level times s. So why do I introduce all this notation? Because it's the convenient notation for which, which, uh, which, which is uh, justified by the following quite re remarkable theorem. It's mainly uh, remark remarkable because everything I present is new, is, is recent. So recent in the sense that um, uh, at, at most five years old. This one is from 1996. So, um, it, uh, and it's by Drajan and Anton. Uh, so it's uh, maybe their first joint paper. It's uh, quite impressive. Uh, I also, let, let me say, I'm, I'm not uh, writing all the names constantly. This theorem was reproven um, very recently by Kazuya, Kawasetsu, and David Redoubt in well, definitely more modern way. So, um, any, but, but uh, they did it here first. So, they classified simple modules. A complete list of simple modules in the category of lower bounded weight modules of the affine vertex algebra of SL2 at admissible level. Please remember, I'm always talking now, I fixed once and for all, level is always an admissible level. Right? Is uh, given by the following list. We have the ones that are in the cushion lustig category, in the ordinary category, and we only have u um, minus uh, one such modules, yeah, I mean such simple modules. Then we have highest and lowest weight modules, and we have u minus one times v minus one such modules. So um, these, these labels, you can remember this, this r label will always, and essentially always go from one to u minus one and the s label. Uh, from one to v minus one, uh, and and then we have um, and and then our relaxed highest weight modules are almost always simple. So here the R and S label is the same as before. What else do I have to specify? Lambda. Remember if I shift my lambda by two, I get the very same module. So it's only uh, uh, parameterized by uh, uh, yeah, modulo 2z, modulo the root letters. And I, because I'm talking about simple modules, I have to exclude two values of the left, uh, of, of the weight, namely the weight lambda r comma s and lambda u minus r v minus s. Remember, um, this lambda r comma s is a convenient notation here for for, for, for the weight labels um, that, that describe highest or lowest weights of modules. Of course, you don't have to remember this notation. It's just, uh, um, but anyway, it is what is this. Um, also, are, are these modules uh, isomorphic? Well, they are uh, all non-isomorphic -iso except for <coughs> This one isomorphism that I'm here now just writing down. And this is just because the uh, Casimir eigenvalue um, for, for two different weight labels is the same. Apart from this, this ones, this all these modules are mutually non-isomorphic. So, and then uh, combining with the result by Fotoni and Zirke, it tells us that we have a complete classification of simple modules of the, um, of the affine vertex algebra of SL2 at admissible level. It's exactly this collection 
together with all their spectral flow twists, which are parameterized by an additional integer that I will always denote by L. Right? There are then, in fact, uh, additional isomorphisms because it turns out that an, a spectral flow flip twist of a D plus can be a D minus and vice versa. And a spectral flow of an L R can be a D plus or D minus. So, so there are a few additional isomorphisms, but uh, this is not crucial for the further discussion. It's, uh, um, yeah. Okay, now let's uh, continue. Um, uh, the, the message I want to uh, say, uh, bring over is also, right? I always say simple models are understood. So they, they, here you, you again see that. And now we have to do the very next thing. We have to go to extensions. We have to wonder what type of extensions that do exist. And um, the logic uh, here is um, the first thing you do is you try to construct as much as possible. You, and this is a difficult thing. And then you hope that you have constructed everything and you know how life is if you have a, a good overview over your toolkit and you try it hard, then you have a good chance that you, you found everything. So you, all you have to do is to prove that there's indeed nothing else. Anyway, um, there is a, something really nice to construct uh, um, extensions. And here I should, uh, uh, I want to say the same thing as before. Uh, this, uh, so this theorem is due to Adamovich. And this, uh, this uh, statement, at least the first half of the statement, has also been done by uh, Kazuya and David, Kawasatsuma and Redout, at, um, uh, roughly at the same time. Uh, so anyway. But, but the second half uh, of this theorem is only Drajan, and, and that was actually um, something that is um, not, not, not easy. You know, most of these things are not easy. So first of all, here are our parameters. We have a spectral flow label L. This is an L here. Um, R and S are in the usual set. And then the statement is that there exist indecomposable modules. Um, which are denoted by sigma L, E plus minus R comma S, and a new one, sigma L, P plus minus R comma S, fitting in the non-split exact sequences. So, so, so he, they, he and, and also David and Kazuya, they, uh, and they, they get in uh, extensions explicitly. So, yeah, and this uh, first expression is really just um, uh, the, the natural affine analog of what I have explained for the relaxed high weight modules. Um, And, uh, but now what is the problem? Right? Uh, one naively might hope if you get uh, all modules from, all simple modules from, from, the, from the lower bound one, from the horizontal subalgebra, then maybe you get this for all modules. And, uh, and, and this is totally wrong, this expectation. Well, this, so it's totally too naive. The, the, the point is you, you have extensions uh, two modules that uh, that uh, that have components in different spectral flow orbits. Uh, one should maybe say say call that. And so here we see uh, this this uh, p plus minus uh, type module. It has a relaxed uh, highest weight module in the orbit. Um, the sigma L as a submodule and the sigma L plus one as a quotient. Anyway, um, yeah, so you, you get these types of modules. And what, what uh, Trajan also um, 
proves is that um, L naught acts not semi simply on on these big points. And this name P is already wisely uh, uh, chosen because eventually you want to show that P is projective. That's what it wants, wants uh, what wants to be. Yeah, and what it what it is. Okay. Now um, there's uh, we have very very few techniques uh, constructing this type of modules, and in fact, um, the only trick that uh, I, I I know is uh, you you do an explicit realization of the FN vertex algebra, and then you 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 glue modules in a, using high shank Lee's delta operator. So I will not explain this gluing procedure, but I, for those of you who are in, uh, interested in it, uh, both uh, Adamovich and Milash, in particular their joint works, they, they have perfect, uh, um, they, they, they are the ones who introduced this uh, construction and they have done that in many, many cases. So you can uh, see that in many cases. Um, the uh, and, and, and I would say this is essentially a standard construction to, to, to glue these modules. What is, what is, so what one needs to understand is uh, how to find good uh, free field realization and free, you'll see it's not quite true. And uh, for, for that, uh, one uses a, a method uh, that one needs to give a name. So I, I think this is a good name. The trick of Adamovich. It's in fact, um, so I, um, uh, Semikartov had an, it, it's based on an idea by Semikartov, um, but uh, Trajan put it to, brought it to good use. So, uh, so what, what do you do is, so it, it turns out every vertex algebra F and vertex algebra, the universal one, can be realized as a sub-algebra of a free field algebra. So what you do is you take a Heisenberg algebra on the Cartan sub-algebra um, together with a beta gamma system uh, associated to the positive and negative roots. And then um, you, you, uh, uh, you, you essentially, uh, I mean, you kind of chiralize the differential operators on the, on, the, on, the, on the flag manifold, and then it gives you a free field realization. Anyway, um, SL2, Heisenberg algebra has rank one. So it's, uh, I call it by pi alpha. So alpha denotes the generator of the Heisenberg algebra. And then we have a single beta gamma system. So beta gamma means it's generated by field, two fields that I call beta and gamma and their non-vanishing OPE is a first order pole. Heisenberg means it's generated by a Heisenberg field and it has, a, a, and the OPE is a second order pole and the bilinear, uh, and, and the norm is the le level shifted by the dual coxeter number K plus two. So inside this, uh, you find fields E of Z to be beta, H of Z to be beta gamma plus the Heisenberg field and F, the most complicated one, the pubic term plus K times a derivative of gamma plus gamma times the Heisenberg field. And one can then fairly quickly check that these fields in, indeed obey the OPE algebra, of the F and vertex algebra of SL2 at level K. So this is the usual working uh, mode realization. And, and uh, it is uh, uh, characterized by the kernel of this operator S. S stands for screening charge. And uh, what it is, it is the residue, or I write it, uh, write this via a contour integral of this, uh, of this intertwining operator. So it's, it's not an operator that acts on the FOC module, uh, on, the, on the vertex algebra, but it maps it to a different module. And here I, I use the hopefully standard notation for, uh, 
for 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 fog module the twining operator. So this is here. This is the usual fog module intertwiner uh, of, of type um, pi goes to pi minus one over k plus two. Um, okay. And now, so the, this is nothing new. This is Wakimoto free field realization, very old story, beginning of the 90s. The in, the, now one has to somehow have a good idea. And the good idea is the following. The, the beta gamma vertex algebra also is a sub-algebra of, uh, of something else, namely of uh, a vertex algebra that I call VH. And what VH is, uh, it is a half lattice VOA. So half lattice VOA in the following in the following sense. Um, it is a, an extension of a rank two. Um, Heisenberg algebra diagonally extended. So mu tilde, mu tilde here denote the generator of, of this. Um, Heisenberg algebra and mu tilde has norm one and nu tilde. I, I introduce I, here the tilde because I will uh, um, change them a little bit in a moment, minus one. And then um, the screening charge is given by Q is uh, uh, the zero mode of, of this one. And then under bosonization uh, and, and under this procedure, E is identified with, uh, I mean, beta is identified with this uh, lattice, lattice VOA field and gamma with this one. The formulas are not that terribly important. Now, why do I do this? Because if we combine this, what do we have here? We have the affine vertex algebra of SL2, the universal one. It is equal to the kernel of the Wakimoto screening uh, of a beta gamma VOA times a Heisenberg VOA. But the beta gamma VOA itself is the kernel of a second screening, which I denoted by Q, um, of a larger VOA. So this means the affine vertex algebra is the intersection of two, two, two uh, 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 of, um, uh, of, of the, the, the kernels of these two screenings acting on this half lattice VOA times the Heisenberg algebra. So what can I do? Now, I, I may be not uh, um, interested in a precise uh, description, but just to fine with an em embedding. So what? how can I get an embedding? Well, I just forget about one of the two kernels. I make my algebra big, bigger, right? So I forget, forget about Q. And then I get an automatically an embedding. Now, so far, so good. Uh, what's the clever thing about it? Well, the clever thing is uh, to write down um, um, the, the screening now in the, uh, so remember this screening uh, is uh, the, the residue of beta times this lattice VOA in Tertwiner. But um, in this bigger algebra, beta is identified with a lattice intertwiner itself. So this means in this bigger, uh, bigger algebra, the screening is identified with this operator. So. And now what do I what do you do? Well you nobody likes lengthy formulas. So you just write this this alpha minus k plus two mu tilde plus nu tilde. You write this as alpha tilde. Why not, right? And uh, since mu tilde has norm one and nu tilde has norm minus one, mu tilde plus nu tilde has norm zero. It's isotropic. In particular, the norm of alpha tilde is the very same as the one of alpha. Now, 
who recognizes this, this screening in this form? Anybody? This is a very, very well known screening. Right? So the answer is uh, this here. You can also type your answer. It's, it's, the, the, it, it's the screening that, uh, that realizes the Virasoro algebra inside the Heisenberg algebra. Right? So the, the Virasoro algebra at central charge CK is the kernel of, and, uh, and, and let me, um, um, of, of, of this S acting on, um, on the Heisenberg algebra generated by, uh, by, by alpha tilde. All right. So, um, right, and, and what do I do here? Here, my, my, my vertex algebra, well, this is a half lattice VOA, so an extension of a rank two Heisenberg algebra along a diagonal lattice. So, so really what it is, it's an isotropic lattice VOA times a Heisenberg VOA, and then I have another Heisenberg VOA. And um, of, of course, the screening just acts on one factor, the whole rest is left invariant. And so now if you follow your, um, uh, your, your, your basis carefully, well, let me first uh, also recall what a CK is. So that central charge is 16 minus six over the shifted level minus six times the shifted level. And now it turns out the free field algebra that we had um, is the very same thing as the Heisenberg algebra for the for the field alpha tilde times another half lattice VOA that uh, Drajan has given the name pi naught. And um, so pi naught is indicates that it's an isotropic half lattice VOA. And a half lattice means it's an extension of a rank two Heisenberg VOA along rank one lattice. And uh, it's very similar, just that um, this mu and nu now have a little bit different norm um, than before. They don't have norm plus minus one, but plus minus k over two. But that's uh, what it is. So why did I uh, present this? Because I think this is a really good technology. It helps, right? It, this is an idea. It's a, you have a big problem realizing modules. So what do you do? You, you try to uh, embed your algebra in, inside a bigger algebra, where this may be very easy to realize module. But uh, of course, every module for the bigger algebra is especially module for the sub-algebra. So, and then of course, you don't get all the modules, but maybe you get a zoo of interesting ones. Um, so anyway, what I, I have explained to, to you is that one has an embedding of the universal affine vertex algebra of SL2 at level k uh, into the, its quantum Hamiltonian reduction, the universal Virasova algebra at corresponding central charge times this half lattice view A that is called pi zero. Now, now let will with a lower index be the simple quotient with the simple. Well, what happens, right? If we have the universal Virasova algebra, if you pass to a homomorphic image, of course, a certain homomorphic image of the affine vertex algebra will embed in there. The question is which one it is, but that's not that hard to determine. And the answer is, I mean, everything I present here is uh, Trajan's work, is if k is admissible but not integral, but in integral we are not interested in because we know they are rational, that everything is known. Then, um, uh, this uh, vectors for the simple quotient. So we have an embedding of the simple affine vertex algebra inside the simple Virasova algebra, which is rational at the central charge. So we have an embedding of our algebra inside of interest inside an, a, a rational VOA. Rational means everything is known, everything is good, and uh, times a free field algebra. 
And now one can look classify this free field algebra, you can classify all modules and um, it, then you can tensor them with all possible uh, simple Virasoro modules. And what will you get? You will get exactly all spectral flow twists of all relaxed high state modules. And if you hit an at atypical value and the one where the relaxed high state module is not simple, then depending on your construction, you either get the E plus or E minus. It's a, it, it, it depends on a choice that you made before. And, uh, it, 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 so that Rajan only worked this out for one choice, but the other one uh, would have been the argument. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, so this procedure is also often called inverse quantum Hamiltonian reduction, or that's maybe the philosophy. So uh, what's the quantum Hamiltonian reduction? <laughs> you have heard about that. If you have an affine vertex algebra, what can you do? You, you, want, you want to pass maybe to a more interesting class of it. So you choose a new evenly potent element in the Lie algebra. And then, it, and then there's an associated complex and differential whose homology is again a vertex algebra, the W algebra associated to it. And uh, this procedure is also called quantum Hamiltonian reduction uh, because it's a natural quantization of the classical one. And um, uh, the quantum Hamiltonian reduction of uh, corresponding to the F of SL2, it's also the only non trivial reduction, uh, is the Viasso algebra. And if the level of uh, SL2 is K, then the, uh, the simple charge of Viasso is the CK I presented. So, um, and uh, now while the quantum Hamiltonian reduction is a straightforward uh, procedure, it's totally unclear that. Um, uh, you you conversely have an, a relation with an, a relation in the other direction, and this Adamovich trick, in in many respects, gives this. But um, it's it's very hard to to generalize these relations to higher levels. So um, it's a, but it's probably quite an important problem. So uh, together with Naoki Genra, uh, we we have a paper where. We explain how this goes in SL3 and it's substantially more difficult. Good. Okay. So my my aim is I want to give a, give you a full characterization of the abelian category of uh, affine SL2 at admissible level. Um, and this means um, I have to now I, I told you the trick how one constructs in the composable uh, modules and now um, I have to tell you how to prove that these are all, well, they are not all, but they are essentially all. And uh, um, let, let me tell you how to do this. So this means we now want to talk about extensions of modules um, more, more explicitly or more specifically. So first of all, for two modules, what, what do, mean, do, we, do we mean by X, the X group, X to n and uh, of, of two modules, where we, we mean the set of equivalence classes. Of exact sequences, of non-trivial exact sequences. Of, of course, we, we ignore the ones that are equivalent to ones that split of the form M is the first uh, one that appears. And then we have N intermediate modules and then an N. So uh, we have uh, equivalence classes of exact uh, sequences of this type. Okay, and now, uh, and the essential problem is, of course, to classify short exact sequences because uh, then, then the rest goes relative straightforwardly. So um, let's see what, um, so this means X1. And now on the, uh, for the lower bounded ones, this is uh, uh, quite easy because as I told you, um, all 
the exact sequences can be seen on the top level. So it turns out we have uh, the extensions that we have already constructed or that I have told you that they can be constructed via a download procedure and nothing else. So the, the extensions between lower bounded modules is totally fine, no um, problem. Uh, but um, now how can we understand extensions between modules that are between a lower bounded module and one that is not one? And it turns out that it's a purely combinatorical problem. So um, let me try to explain this. So first of all, you, introduce uh, another vocabulary and we decided to call it pi type. Um, so what, what pi denotes a set of simple roots of your Lie algebra G. So for SL2, it just would be, be pi is either the set considering, consisting of the positive simple roots or the negative, we have two choices for pi. Um, and now um, let M be an indecomposable module in our category of weight modules, in our big category. So in particular, this means M uh, allows for direct sum of uh, uh, decomposition in weight spaces and weights lie in a, sim in a single coset of the um, of the root letters and a uh, conformal weight lies in a single coset of the integers. And so, and we say such a module is of pi type if it satisfies the following condition. So for, for any conformal weight that can appear, there exists an associated somehow extremal weight label called mu of delta with the property that uh, the corresponding weight space is non-zero. So in particular, no lower bounded module is of pi type because that would have many such weight spaces that are just, uh, but this weight is extremal in the sense if I shift my weight label in one direction, determined by the choice of, um, of uh, positive roots, um, then uh, this weight space vanishes. And so here for, for beta and the cone given, uh, given by uh, at the, the cone of the root lattice corresponding to just a non-negative linear combinations of positive roots. And of course, I have to exclude the zero vector. So the picture is the following. Um, if I again, again think about as my, uh, my, my vertical x axis here, the, the, the conformal weight axis, and here is my SL2 or my G weight axis, the picture is that the um, conformal weight is unbounded, but in one direction. Uh, so, but but I only have non-zero weight spaces in, uh, yeah, here in, in this this region, and, uh, and so, so it, it it has a, a shape like this. Now, and and really, you want to imagine this with the, this picture because what do you want? So let me. Um, um, so why why is this interesting? Because this gives you a combinatorical reason. In fact, a very simple combinatorical reason for for the vanishing of uh, x one 
if um, n is a lower bounded module, and m is of pi type. Why is this? So let's let's draw the picture again. So we have here the um, the, the the module m of pi type. For example, a picture like, like this. Um, let me maybe change color to denote the uh, coordinate axis, highest uh, conformal weight and Cartan sub I mean weight. And then um, and then we have a lower bounded module. For example, here one uh, corresponding to a lowest weight module. And now what happens uh, if we have an extension of n by m? So this is uh, right. What what does it mean? Is that, that that means if we take a generating vector of n, then there must exist a a, a, a map at the universal envelopment algebra of G hat must map this vector to a given vector of m, right? But if these are too far, but but now what do we else we have? When well, we are talking about an f and e algebra, yeah, PBW theorem, and right? every element can be written give, give a, a, a written as an ordered polynomial in the usual way. And so, in particular, um, if if the gap is too uh, too big, then uh, the, this map has to to factor to uh, through uh, through a space that is empty. So that can't be, and so that such and such an extension can't exist. Um, it's probably the best thing one writes it down for for oneself once for an example. Um, uh, SL two anyway. So if if here um, we have the vector v for example, and here w, and uh, let me write a little bit more. V is a generating. Um, vector of n then uh, uh, and we have such an extension then there must uh, exist, exist an element in the universal enveloping algebra such that um, this element maps our given generating vector to a chosen vector of of of, of m of the, the module we extend by and um, now we have pbw uh, we can that means we can write x as an ordered polynomial with respect to the usual order, ordering. In particular, um, uh, modes that lower conformal weight are to the right of modes that don't do that. And uh, and uh, de of course, depending on on, on, your, on your modules, but very often that will happens that such a, a map needs to to factor through an empty space. Which is an impossibility and which tells you that such an extension can't exist. Okay, very good. Um, so I have told you the main techniques that go into studying um, extensions. So let's recall this um, very good thing uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the lower bounded modules, you just study finite SL2 or finite G and you, you're good. Um, then uh, then uh, to, to construct extensions, there is this uh, fantastic trick uh, to, to pass to free to, to good realizations, to, 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 to use modules of a larger algebra to, 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 to get modules. And then, um, uh, and, and then the idea is really you, you construct what you can, you show that uh, extensions vanish wherever you can show it. And then uh, you, you, and then you try to prove that everything is uniquely determined by the data that you found that there exists a unique category that has these properties. So, and, um, and, and uh, uh, so, so yeah, and then let me maybe explain this further. So now, now we, we, fix, uh, we fix an R in our 
allowed label uh, uh, a set of labels and the same thing for s and then we uh, and then it turns out we have a single block that i will denote cr comma s corresponding to this la uh, um, label and uh, this block has the following objects it has simple objects which uh, i will denote I keep for the moment a, a superscript denoting these labels, and then because I don't want to write so much, um, so you have simple modules, and you want to have a somehow uniform notation. So what I call L uh, with an integer uh, subscript is here a certain spectral flow depending on all these labels of the highest weight modules and um, the label the r label is a certain number i call phi r comma l and the s label is this one here we have l is an integer and m is an integer between zero and um, v minus two and this phi r l so it, it turns out the, the thing, the notation and so on is a little bit clumsy and you have to work a little bit to make it nice and uniform. So it's, a, and anyway, um, it, it turns out this block has a, an integer family of simple modules and it's, it's this specific uh, uh, family and uh, we have, and, and if one uses the techniques I have presented, one proves the following. There are no extensions between the, these simples and simples in a different block. So in that the sense, the, the name block is already justified. And moreover, one has the, the following properties. Uh, uh, and, uh, we, uh, and let, let's call them, give them a few names. So first of all, um, one, One has that there are, it turns out this pi type argument that I presented is good enough to, ex, uh, to, to, to exclude any further extensions um, of simples by simples. Here, do you need a RS? Yeah, I, I, I know, um, I, I know, and then. Uh, um what I from, from from now on I write I write ln for lnrs just because otherwise I would all the time write the superscript yeah <laughs> and all, only confuse us it turns out all these blocks have the same uh, all these uh, blocks have the same properties so it's, it's very uniform it's quite nice now um Now the, we, we denote uh, the module corresponding to these, ex, uh, these uh, extensions by e plus minus n. So these are, this means this here is the uh, non-trivial non short exact non-split non sequence extending ln by ln plus minus one. Uh, and um, and, and then using the criteria as before, one gets a list already of a bunch of X ones that vanish. So um, it, it turns out all these extensions vanish by 
it, in applying this um, this pi type criterion, this combinatorial re, uh, criterion that that there's a too big gap between modules to 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 allow for non-trivial extension and um, the same type of criterion also forbids uh, certain um, certain extension between the relaxed highest weight modules to exist. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, um, but but then um, we know that these extensions are non-zero because using the Adamovich trick, these extensions were explicitly constructed. So. Uh, so th th this is how one proceeds. See, one 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 constructs as much as one can. One constructs n as many extensions as one can. One writes down, and then one uses criteria, combinatorical criteria, actually, to to prove that as many ex extensions as possible vanish. And now, uh, and now one uh, one takes these extensions one. Um, uh, that one has and writes down corresponding to uh, long exact sequences in cohomology and looks at the constraint it gives. And if one looks at it for, for a long time, one realizes these properties uniquely specify the category of this block. There's, the, this block has a uniquely fixed structure by these uh, properties. And uh, so uh, by the way, everything I present here is um, re really everything I present here about uh, this extension and classification of SL2 problem is a joint project with um, Tomiyuki and Kazuya. So what, what we do now is uh, uh, this is actually quite enjoyable because you just put on your board the long exact sequences and you just stare at it, you write down there, you get a zero or one, et cetera, and you see what, what it constrains you. Yeah, so it turns out it follow, uh, from, uh, from, from this, it follows that um, that you have these uh, X ones and and these are the only extensions of this type in the sense that for any other label of L, the extension vanishes. There's no extension. A similar statement in the other direction. And I, um, I write uh, the theorem down in the order of logic you, you need to do it. So, so each following statement in order to prove it, you need the previous ones, at least, at least some of them. Okay, so so uh, this these these four statements are kind of the the, the preparation thing, and um, once once you have it, you you come to the important uh, statement, and it's the statement that there exists an object P n, which is indecomposable, and the existence is of course what has uh, yeah um, the, I mean uh, uh, and and this uh, uh, this this object is the uh, you, you get it because uh, this extension is non-zero. 
And here you have this uh, non zero extensions and um, So the, the non-trivial statement about this one so far is that um, uh, the, the, these, two ex, uh, um, these two different extensions are described by the same object. This Pn is the same object. And moreover, Pn deserves its name because it's projective and injective. And it's Levy diagram. Is the following: It has a four composition factor. It has an L n as submodule, justifying the label P n. So P n stands for projective cover and injective hull, in fact, of um, simple module L n. Then, if you quotient by L n. It has a ln minus one plus ln plus one as submodule. And then at the top, you have another copy of ln. Um, good. And then finally, uh, the complete statement about possible extension is that the xs of ln by lm is one dimensional if n and m are close enough to each other and an evenness condition is satisfied. And zero otherwise. So this can be written uh, much more compactly. In other words, the, the whole x X of LNM as a graded uh, object is can be identified with um, X to the N minus M absolute value times polymo polynomials and X squared. That's actually how you want to think it. But you, you, you always like to identify extensions with a ring and modules for a ring. So, so I, for example, so some particular uh, right self extensions are identified just with polynomials in X squared, and then other extensions are identified with modules for that. Okay, uh, yeah. So now, and now I, yeah, I, I think this, this uh, I hope you're not too tired, but now I will uh, give you an example on of how to prove this. It, it, it's a really, maybe 20 times doing a computation like I'm doing now. And all these computations are like actually very uh, quick. So first of all, let's recall if we have a, uh, an exact sequence of such a type, then such a non-split exact sequence gives the corresponding one uh, here. Uh, I mean, it gives, the, it gives a, long, a long, uh, long sequence, long exact sequence in homology and the, the usual thing. We have here the corresponding home spaces. And then we have, we go on with the higher homes. <laughs> uh, and then it goes on. And we can also go in the other uh, direction. I mean, um, and here just the role of um, A and C is interchanged. Um, and we continue again with higher, higher, higher homes. And so on, and and now one what one does simply is one one chooses a wise 
a long a short exact sequence that uh, one already has an extension one already has one writes down the corresponding long exact sequences one writes down which homes and higher homes one already knows are zero or one dimensional and one draws the conclusions so example we take x to be um, one of our simple modules say lm and we, uh, we consider for a b c uh, this non-split sequence right and now we plug it in so then um, for example and and i will only write down the portions that we need for example we we get then the um uh we, we get then this this uh, this piece of our long exact sequence in um, in cohomology three x ones right we just look at the three x ones that we have and why is that good because we already know from property one well that x one between ln and lm almost always vanishes right in half here by property so this means we we already know that um, these ones are uh, the, uh, zero except if m is equal to n plus minus one and um, i'm sorry here i i, I uh, one label is incorrect um i forgot the plus one here. The third one yeah yeah and uh, and so for, from this it follows uh, immediately that uh, we already get that x1 of ln by e plus n of course if, if we have a zero here and a zero here right which which happens in most cases uh, then we must of course also get a zero in the middle and so so this means we get that uh yeah, this is an m uh, this extension is zero in all cases except possibly four And this is how it usually goes. You write down your corresponding exact sequences and your, your problem is already reduced to very few cases. So now, um, now you go on, you have four cases and you consider them. So first uh, it turns out that the cases n and n plus two are excluded by what? Well, let's look it up by what we proved before, right? We, we, uh, uh, before we already know here that certain x ones uh, between uh, ln and e plus vanishes and the n and n plus two is already in there if as you see and the labels differ by two by by properties by the properties and so in fact we only have to look at the values uh, n plus minus one so and, and for that you, you do a case by case analysis so for example, you look at the case M is equal to N plus one. And in that case, it turns out you have to write a little bit. So you write down now your quite a big portion of your long exact sequence. Yeah, a few home spaces. And the, the home spaces, of course, you know. But you also use that you already know your extensions between samples. And now let's, let's write down what we already know. We know there here, there is no extension. But what else? We know this one here, this is one dimension. What do we know about this one? Well, this home space is clearly also one dimensional, right? Home space from a simple to a simple is one dimensional. And this one, if one looks at the structure of E plus N, one sees now nah, E plus N doesn't have LN plus one as a submodule. There is no homomorphism. So from this, we you, you see uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, hom, uh, this uh, C and C that must be, uh, of course, a, 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 a surjection. We have an exact sequence. So the only possibility here that we have is that this one vanishes. Uh, and and th these types of games you play and uh, uh, I know you have listened to me for almost two hours so two more minutes uh, I just present the last case of this example 
again you do um, uh, again you write down uh, an, an, an appropriate portion of your long exact sequence uh, in cohomology and you write down what you know um so here this is an n minus one so this is a there is no such extension here we have an extension here there is no homomorphism and you see the only possible ability for this statement to be uh, correct is that this space is also one dimensional and in this way you you derive one statement after the other yeah very good so let me tell you this is all for this week i think uh, you have listened enough um i will go on so this is this clarifies the abelian story i can maybe tell you a little bit how this relates to quantum groups next time um but uh, what i really want to tell you is uh I have three things I can potentially tell you. I can tell you how to prove that one gets a tensor category structure, and I definitely want to tell you that. I can tell you how to compute certain uh, fusion rules, but that's a tricky business. And uh, and I can tell you the old Valinda story. So I have to decide. Uh, it all depends on, on, on time, how, how I do with the rest. But in principle, these three topics are the, what I want to cover. Uh, next week, May, maybe not all of them, depending on time. And uh, yeah, yeah. If Any... you if you cannot finish in next week, you can do one more week. <laughs> you decide. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> sure, sure, I can do that. <laughs> Let, let's first uh, thank Thomas for today. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you yes. next week. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're welcome. I'll see you next week. Okay. Yeah. If if somebody has any has any question, maybe you can briefly ask Thomas. <laughs> yeah, online the interaction is always a little bit difficult, right?